everyone to Celebration Church. I'm Victoria. I am part of the Bay family here, and we just want to welcome everyone, everyone that's here. Nice to see your happy, smiling faces this morning. For everyone online, we're sorry that you are not able to be here in person, but we are especially welcome. I'm glad that you're able to join us online. We hope that you guys had a great week. Um, the children started back to school, so yay, nay. <laughs> kind of mixed emotions here. Um, just a couple announcements before we get started this morning. First is our Connect card. If you're here with us in person, there is one in back of every seat. If you're new with us, we would love for you to fill it out. Um, just put some information on it so that we can get to know you a little better. Um, be in contact with you. If you are online, there is a link in the description box for you to go fill that out as well. We just, um, we're just we not going to harass you or drive by your house or anything. We just may send you a little text or a little email or something to say, hi, nice to meet you, glad you're with us. And to be with any prayers that you would like for us to join you with. That is also available to put on there as well. Um, one of the main things happening for us this week is our women's conference. We are so excited. Yay. Um, Pastor Matt's sister, Miss Carla, is going to be our guest speaker. We are very excited to meet her and get to know her better. Um, if you are wanting to come or interested, please sign up either in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet or online. You can go to our website, and there's a link to sign up there just so that we can make sure we have enough of food, enough of child care for everyone. Um, we It's going to be Friday and Saturday. We have lots of plans, lots of fun things, and we cannot wait to see you guys here with us. Um, our band um, worship team is going to be playing. They're awesome things. Very excited. Um, our next thing is our meet and greet. We are starting something new here at Celebration Church. Um, once a month, hopefully, we are going to have a community, community little outreach. We're going to be after church. We're going to eat, do fellowship, hang out. Our first one is August the 29th. So please plan on joining us afterwards. Again, food will be provided by Celebration Church this month. So we cannot wait for that to sign up with you. Also, if you're wanting to get connected here with Celebration Church, we have something called Texting Church. So if you could text CELEBRATE to um, the number, I can never remember the number. <laughs> it's 297-7435. This would just let us send you text messages, keep you up to date, let you know what's happening here at Celebration Church so that we are all here and um, we can make these plans. Um, I think that is it. So I am going to pray and then our worship band will get started. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful week that you've given us. We thank you for letting our children go back to school safely. We pray that you continue to just cover them, cover them and um, with knowledge and safety. Father, be with our teachers. Father, just let them have a great week. Father, we pray that you open our minds and hearts and spirits this morning to receive what you have for us. I pray that you be with the worship team. Father, I pray that you just give them the right notes to play, the right worship sheet. Father, we pray for Pastor Matt as he brings um, the word that you have given him. We, I pray that you just let us receive that. I pray that you just be with us and continue to just guide us and show us your love. In that name we pray. Amen. Man, I just invite you to stand with us as we uh, just praise the Lord this morning. So let's just sing together. Sing this out. All I see is the battle. You see my victory. As I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am saved. Let's sing this out, church, when I fight. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands in. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle 
Sing that bridge one more time. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Yes, he does. Nothing can stand. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Come on. Nothing can stand against the power of Almighty Fortress. And Almighty Fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows.
praise this morning.
you every day. I need you, Jesus. Come on. Whatever you're going through, begin to sing out your love to him. I can't make it without you. I need you every day. I need Jesus. Come on, we're going to go back to that bridge. For every eye is singing. For every eye will sing. Just to declare it. Do you believe that he's the king, that he's the center of it all, that his name is above all names? If you do, let's just give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, worship team. You may be seated. Thank you, Kenneth, for bringing over the table. Man, I love that song. I love declaring that Jesus is the center of everything, that everything was made for him and in him and through him. Amen. Amen. Welcome to Celebration Church. My name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at Celebration. I want to welcome you. If you're watching online, just give us a a hands up, a a wave, or... Uh, a, a heart emoji if you're watching online. We're glad to have you this morning. We're, we're, we're glad that you're with us and worshiping with us. And we thank you for being here in person this morning as well. So we have just kind of wrapped up a series of, of, of walking through Colossians. And today the Lord has just been steering me towards a message in, in Mark chapter 11 verse 12 through 22, and we're going to read that in just a minute, but before we do, I want to make you aware of a couple things. Normally, we have sermon notes, but today I wanted to see how spiritual you were, if you would actually take notes on your own, so I'm I'm keeping an eye on you too, all of you people out there, to see if you're actually taking notes. Now, that's not really the case. I just wanted to give us a little break of not having notes for a Sunday or two. It's not because I don't think they're important, because I do, but feel free if you want to take notes on your own. I believe God has a very powerful and important message for us today in this chapter of Mark. And before we get started, and before I even read the scripture, I want to pray for us, and then I want to give a little bit of background to what is happening during this time in uh, this chapter of Mark and what Jesus is going through. So would you just pray with me? Father, I just, 
God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you that you sent your only son to be crushed for our iniquities. Or another way to say it is to be crushed for our sin. That he bore the wrath of God so that we could be returned to relationship with you, God. So, Father, I just pray that we don't forget that, Jesus, you are the center of everything, that your name is the name above all names, and that one day every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. I thank you, God, for the word that you have given us this morning. I pray that you would open our minds, that you would open our hearts to what you would have us here today. And that, God, I pray that it would not be just informational, but, God, I pray that it would be transformational. That your word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword separating between bone and marrow, between soul and spirit. Father, I just pray that your word would just encompass our hearts today. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just rest on us this morning, that you would give us wisdom and insight and understanding from your word that testifies of the Son of God, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In his name we pray, amen and amen. So I want to give you some background and and timing of what is going on in this scripture in Mark. And by the way, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 11, verse 12 through 22. That's going to be the main text that we're going to be walking through this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles here kind of scattered throughout the worship center on the back of of chairs, and you're welcome to take that Bible. That is our gift to you if you don't have one. And so here's the background. Jesus, in in this chapter in Mark, has has just kind of come into the town on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this is a time that is called Passover. This is Passover week. And the Jews are celebrating their freedom from Egyptian slavery. And also what the Jewish people are anticipating in this time is they're anticipating that the Messiah will free them, the coming Messiah will free them from Rome's oppression. However, Jesus is there who is the Messiah He's there to do something totally different that they didn't expect. He's there to defeat Satan, to defeat sin, and to defeat death. And so even the disciples are not really understanding this at the moment. And what's interesting here in this story is that we see that that Jesus gets angry, that he gets mad. And some of the things that Jesus says here and almost that he does almost seems out of character or out of character of who Jesus is or what we know him to be. And so I believe that when things like that happen, they they kind of flip the script a little bit that it's really important for us to, to understand what God is trying to get us to understand and to know, and even for the disciples at the time. So I don't, I don't know about any of you, but I know it's hard to believe this, but there's been many a times in my life when I've got angry. And I know you look at me and you're like, really? He's such a laid back, kind of calm guy. He's like, he probably should have grew up in California, like on a surfboard. But believe it or not, I'm 100%, almost 100% Irish. And, you know, as they say, the Irish kind of have that Irish temper sometimes. So I know it's, I know, just kind of imagine, I know it's hard for you to believe that this guy gets angry sometimes, right? And I don't feel too bad because we see here that, and there's other places, but Jesus gets angry. Of course, there's a difference in Pastor Matt's anger and Jesus's anger. In fact, there's two kinds of anger, right? Now, I know looking out into this audience, I can just look at all of you and I know that you don't get angry, right? that you are so spiritual and so full of God's love 
that you never get angry, right? Like Betsy never gets angry. I can just look at her with that red Irish hair, and I'm, I'm like, she never gets angry. She's so spiritual. She loves Jesus, and the wheels on the bus go round and round that she just, people just cut her off in traffic. They stay in the left lane. They never use their blinkers, and she does not get angry. But Pastor Matt is different. I, I struggle with that sometimes. I'm confessing before you, okay? I'm, I can't see you people online, but I bet you never get angry either. And so what we see in the Bible <clears throat> is that there's two kinds of anger. There's a righteous anger, and there's an unrighteous anger. And so what does a righteous anger mean? Basically, here's what it means. A righteous anger is when you get angry at what makes God angry. In fact, Psalms 4.4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Unfortunately, I have been uh, guilty of the other kind of anger many times in my life, the unrighteous anger. And what makes God angry is when there's a pervert, perversion of His goodness. And there's a word for that, and it's called evil. That's really what evil is. Evil is a, a twisting and disfiguring of God's goodness and of His glory. Unrighteous anger is when we get angry when something offends us, or we could say it a different way, when something basically slights our own pride. It really has nothing to do about being anger over the marring of God's glory or His goodness. That's unrighteous anger. And a lot of times when we have that unrighteous anger, that anger has control of us instead of us having control of the anger. Amen? That's another way to say it. And so, some of you may be sitting there, maybe you've been taught this, maybe you've grown up this way, or maybe you've had this thought that, man, it just... It doesn't seem right for me to have anger or to be emotional. And I believe, like the Bible says, that we were created in the image of God. And I believe, and you can disagree with me, that's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. I believe that God created us with emotions because He is an emotional God. But now there, there's a big difference between God's emotions and our emotions. And I have to bring all this up to give you context of why Jesus gets angry in this text. In fact, the scripture is pretty clear to say that God is love, that he feels love, that God is a jealous God, that he gets angry. Zephaniah says that God feels joy. And actually in Psalm 24, it says that God laughs, that he has a sense of humor. But see, our emotions are different than God's because ours are flawed by this thing called sin, right? Compared to God who is perfect and holy and righteous, so our emotions are different because of our depravity from sin. And so as imperfect and flawed humans, our emotions and our decisions, they can change faster than weather or they can change from moment from moment right? Some of you in here, your emotions change like this, right? Some of you watching online can be happy one second and totally angry the next. But God, He's not fickle. God is not on this emotional roller coaster. He does not change. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever, amen? That's what the book of Hebrews says, and so he's not on this emotional roller coaster. In fact, he doesn't wake up and say, um, I just don't feel like being God today. You know what? I don't, feel, I don't even feel like showing up at Celebration Church this morning. You know, it's kind of raining. Um, it's a little humid. My stomach's a little queasy. Right? I just don't feel like showing up. I don't, I don't want to be God today. That's not the God that we serve. He's the same today forever. He is good he is just, and He is true. So let's go to this chapter. Hopefully you've had plenty of time to turn there on your phone or in your Bible, right? And let's read the Scripture. Let's read what happens here, and hopefully we're going to bring it up. 
And so here's what it says. Verse 12, on the following day when they came from Bethany. Now, by the way, a few weeks back, I preached about Lazarus and the death of Lazarus, right? And Mary and Martha. And more than likely, Jesus was probably with Mary and Martha and Lazarus because they lived in Bethany. And here it says that Jesus, he was hungry. Now, this may shock some of you. You may not know this, but Jesus, who is God, he's 100% God and 100% man. So here we see Jesus is hungry because he is man. He gets hungry like us. In fact, like me, he may have been what we call hangry. Now, if you don't know what that means, you can ask somebody to your left or right quietly, what does hangry mean? We kind of see this play out a little bit here. And so Jesus is walking from Bethany. He's going to Jerusalem for Passover week. By the way, at Passover week, there's what you have to understand is there's hundreds of thousands of Jews and Gentiles coming to celebrate Passover week. They're coming to the temple. This, is, this was like the Mecca. This was um, the, the place to be this time of year. Okay, This is a big deal. And so Jesus, it says, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. Remember, he's hungry. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, hear this now, Jesus says to it, he's getting personal with this tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and he began... All right, let's pause right there. So take that scripture out, because I don't want to get to that yet. So here we see Jesus getting angry. We see that Jesus is hungry because he's all man, and he's all God, and he gets hungry just like us. He sees this fig tree in the distance, but the tree just has leaves on it. Now, I don't know if this has ever happened to any of you, but maybe when you were in school, maybe when you were at some event or something, and you, you pull out your wallet, and you have like 2 or $3 left, right? And you're hungry, and you go to that vending machine, and you only have those $3 left, and you put those, those crumpled up you know, dollar bills, and you put it in, and it spits it out because it's so wrinkly and dirty and sweaty, it doesn't want to accept it, and you're like, no, accept my dollar. And it finally takes it, and you're like, yes, Snickers, right? And the thing goes, and it stops. And you're, it's, like, it's like right there, and you're like, what? What just happened? My last $3, I'm dying of hunger, and you just hang up on me? And what happens? You start shaking it, and you might kick it, Right? You might mutter some words that are unholy words in your unrighteous anger, right? And you might even curse that vending machine. How dare you? You took my last $3. You don't even realize there's people filming this and putting it on Instagram that you don't even know. They're laughing at you. Maybe you've never done that. Maybe it's just me. But that's almost the feeling that we could get when Jesus sees this fig tree with no fruit on it. But remember in verse 13, if you can go back, Gabe, it says when he came to it and found nothing but leaves, you're like, okay, what's going on? But then Mark says, for it was not the season for figs. So you're like, okay, Jesus. Why are you getting personal with this fig tree? What do you got against the fig tree? It's not even the season, right? And you think, well, maybe Jesus is not just here. Maybe he's not having righteous anger. But here's what I want you to understand. I want to give you a little context to the fig trees. So we know because of the text that this is Passover, right? This is basically around March or April. And for fig trees in March or April, they begin to have fruit, 
okay, come out, but they're typically not ready until August. In other words, the harvest of fig trees is not typically done until August, but there should be something more than just leaves on this fig tree. In fact, the way that fig trees work is they produce the fruit first and then the leaves come. Okay, you, you, you smelling, smelling what I'm cooking now, Trey? So Jesus comes to this tree, and even though it's not harvest season, this tree should have some fruit on it. And he finds nothing but leaves. And so the fact that he shows up and finds nothing but leaves, there's something going on with this fig tree. And I know I didn't give you notes today, but I want you to take a mental note or if you have some blank paper, I, you might want to write this question down that I'm about to ask you. If Jesus was here today in person or if he was to come to your lunch after this or come to your home after this and he looks at your life, is he going to see fruit? Or is he just going to see leaves? And so I want us to look at John chapter 15 because there's some things that Jesus says even in John chapter 15. If we can bring that up, Gabe. Here's what Jesus says. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That should cause you to pause for a minute. Let that sink in what I just read. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Guess what season we're going through right now as a faith family? We are being pruned right now in case you haven't noticed. And sometimes when you're being pruned, it's uncomfortable. Sometimes when you're being pruned, it hurts a little bit. It stings your pride a little bit. But why? Why is he doing it? He's doing it because his discipline, his pruning, helps us look more like his son. So back to this. He says he prunes it that it what? That it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Keep going. Abide in me and I in you. That's a word for all of us that we should meditate on today. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Uh-oh. So he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, you cannot bear fruit. We need a Savior. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He repeats that again. Go to verse 8 for me. Well, no, let's, let's, let's read 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. This should cause you to pause. This should cause you to examine your heart. This should cause you to examine your life. If you are professing to be a Christian, if you are saying that I am a child of God, that I am a son of God, that I am a daughter of God, you should be asking yourself, right now am I abiding in Christ? And I can tell you that this is scary, scary stuff to me because I don't want to be thrown away. I don't know what that necessarily means, but he goes on to say that not only they are they thrown away and withers, he says they are gathered and they are thrown into the fire and they are burned. This is not something we do, people. This is something that we are. We don't just profess these truths, we actually live them out. 
And we can only live them out if we know what these truths are. There's another series that we're going to be getting into soon. It's called Convictions. And here's why. Because I'm reading a book, and this is off topic for just a second, so stay with me. But I'm reading a book right now that was written in 2001. It's called The Connecting Church. And in that book... Okay, it says that the the research that they did at that time, they did a poll of people who confessed to be Christians. And what they found from that study is that 84% of the people that confess to be Christians do not know what they believe. They do not understand what we profess to be and do as Christians. They have no idea. That was in 2001. 84% of Christians do not know the basic tenets of Christianity. This is 20 plus years later. What do you think that number is now? Do you think that more Christians know what what we were supposed to believe as Christians now than they did in 2001? Because I don't. And so this has been a a burden that God has put on my heart and Pastor BJ's heart that, hey, we need to go back to the basics because we have people at Celebration Church, praise God, from all different backgrounds and ethnicities, and we love that, and denominations, right? But we need to be on the same page as what is the essentials of the gospel? What are we supposed to be doing and believing and living out as Christians? So I encourage you, as we get closer to doing that series, do not miss that. Because you may think you know all the basics. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. And so, I don't want anyone here to be a branch that withers, that God gathers, and that He throws into the fire and burns. So so what is that fruit? What is God looking for as fruit in our lives? It's found throughout the Bible, but mainly in Galatians chapter 5, right? Here's, it's nine things. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit that Jesus is looking for if he comes to examine your life. Now, I'm not here today before you to say that I'm exhibiting all nine of those fruits. And the truth is, is that this thing is called sanctification. It's a process. It's not that you have to be exhibiting all nine of those all the time, 100% of the time, 24 hours, seven days a week. But if Jesus comes to your house today and he shows up to have dinner with you or lunch with you and he examines your heart, he should find some fruit. Amen? Matthew chapter 7 He says it this way, you will know them by their fruit. You will recognize them by their fruit. So I'm here to tell you something else today, that some of you are disappointed because you didn't get that promotion at work. Some of you are disappointed today watching online because that relationship that you had, it didn't work. Some of you are upset today because you didn't get into that school, that college that you wanted to get into. And I'm here to tell you that maybe it's because it was all leaves and no fruit. And that God saved you from something that would not help you bear fruit. Amen? So when God looks at your life, does he find fruit or does he find nothing but leaves? You see, Jesus is using the fig tree here as an object of hypocrisy. If you want to know what what gets Jesus 
turned up, as we like to say now, right? It's hypocrisy. In fact, he gets angry when people claim to have the truth, but they live like they don't, they don't live it out. They claim to have the truth, but they don't live that truth out. That's what hypocrisy is. In fact, when we act and behave like we don't need the grace of God, then we are acting very much like a Pharisee. In fact, he talks about this in Matthew chapter 23. Can we bring that up, Gabe? Here's what he's saying. He's talking to the the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. What is Jesus saying here to these Pharisees? He's saying, practice what you preach. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not talking about perfection. It doesn't mean that we have to be perfect in practicing everything that we preach. But when we behave like we don't need God, we act like a hypocrite. And so here is this fig tree that should have fruit, but when Jesus gets close, it only has leaves, and he's using this as an example for all of us that if you keep living like that, that will, what will fall upon us is a curse. And I don't know about you, but the last thing that I want in my life and for all eternity is to fall under the curse of God. And so I talk to people all the time. I invite people to church, and here's what they say. I don't know about going to church. You know, church is just, it's just a bunch of hypocrites. And sometimes when I'm feeling a little froggy, you know what I say? Well, there's always room for one more. <laughs> That's when I'm feeling the unrighteous, like anger. I just let that out. Just let it go. But this is not about being perfect. Yes, Church is full of hypocrites. But I love how R.C. Sproul said it. Great theologian. This is what he said. Listen to me. I forgot to give you this, Gabe. He said, all hypocrites are sinners. Not all sinners are hypocrites. You see, when we come into the kingdom, that's when we stop being We're still sinners, but that's when we start to do this transition from being sinners and to not always being a hypocrite. Because God sanctifies us through His Word. It's about admitting that we are sinners and we are seeking God's grace to continually look more like Him, to look more like Jesus, to be sanctified more. See, hypocrisy, hypocrisy... is continually projecting what you are not. And the reason that Jesus came to this earth is to meet us in our sin and save us from it. And to save us from our hypocrisy. To save us from being a Pharisee. And so the reason that Jesus is cursing this fig tree is because it should have had fruit. And it didn't. And now Jesus is using this to tell us the story of how it's going to not be blessed, but cut off. And then right in between this story of the fig tree, Mark like switches gears and sandwiches in another story. And let's pick up because I want us to see this. This is important too. It's verse 15 through 17, Gabe. And so they came to Jerusalem, right? Remember, they were coming to Jerusalem for Passover. He's already cursed the fig tree. And they enter into the temple. And Jesus begins to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Trey, you can come on up. So we see that Jesus curses the fig tree, and now he's cleansing the temple. And here's the context of what happened why Jesus gets so angry that he's driving people out of the temple courts as he's flipping over tables and getting turned up, as we like to say. Remember, this is Passover season. People are coming from all over the world to get forgiveness for their sins or to have them forgiven. And to do that, they would need to buy an animal to sacrifice. See, Jesus is not mad about what they're doing. He's not mad that they're selling these animals there. It's a matter of him being mad at how they are doing it. That woke some of y'all up, by the way. I appreciate that, Trey. It's not what they are doing. It's the how they are doing it. And here's what I mean by that. Jesus knows the motives of their heart. He knows the motives of our hearts. He knows their intentions. How many people know that you can do the right thing for the wrong reasons? How many people know that you can give for the wrong reasons, right? How many people know that just because you're in church today, just because you're watching online today, doesn't mean that you are in Christ? And so God cares about the why. He cares about the motivations of your heart. And so these merchants, these priests, what they were doing is they were selling doves at 15 times the normal price. And so Jesus turns over the tables of those selling doves. Why? Because the doves were the poor man's sacrifice. See, in Leviticus 5-7, it says this, Anyone who can't afford lambs bring two doves to the Lord as penalty for sin. And so Jesus sees what these merchants and these priests are doing, that there's poor people coming into the the temple courts to buy these doves because they can't afford a lamb. And these jokers are selling the doves at 15 times the price. They're selling them at at a premium. They're profiting off of the poor man's hope to be forgiven and healed of his sins. And Jesus says, no, no, we're not going to do this. And that's when he gets angry. That's when he turns up. That's when he flips the tables. And he says, get out of here. It's not because they were selling something. Because I know some of you are sitting there thinking, well, there's some church merch right out there. When this service is over, we're going to burn that church merch. Right? It's not the what, it's the how. It's the intentions of their hearts. It's what they were doing, selling at a premium. And Jesus says, no, no, you're not going to profit off of people's desire for forgiveness and healing. We're not going to do that. And so he gets mad. But I'm here to tell you, and he, and he got mad with a righteous anger because they were perverting God's goodness. Amen? But here's the good news that I want you to see today. That if you can't afford a dove, there's a lamb that he's willing to sacrifice for you. He's willing to give his life for you. To lay his life down willingly and freely because he knows that it's more blessed to give than to receive. So when you can't afford a dove, the Lamb of God says, I will lay my life down for you. In fact, Jesus is not just mad about the doves, but also about this culture of exclusivity. In fact, if you go back to that scripture, Gabe, back to to verse 16. Go, Go to 17. Here's what he says. 
He says, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And so what they were doing is they were excluding the Gentiles. They were keeping the Gentiles out. In fact, this was the only this is the only place that the Gentiles could come and even get close to the presence of God. And because of all this, they were getting pushed out. They were being excluded. And Jesus sees what happens and he says, I know that you thought the Messiah was going to cleanse the temple of Gentiles because that's what the Jews were thinking. He says, but it's quite the opposite. I've come to clean the temple for the Gentiles. Amen. Is anyone thankful today that he cleansed the temple for you and for me? So it's a house of prayer for all nations, for all tribes, for all tongues. He curses the tree. He cleanses the temple to change their hearts. Skip down to to verse 20, Gabe. Look what, what Peter says. It says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, as if he's surprised that Jesus said something and it happened. He says, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. You see, Jesus was announcing to the disciples, he was announcing to us 2,000 plus years later that anything that is not rooted in me will wither away and die. So I don't care what you like, what your passions are, if it's not rooted, what your hobbies are, if, it, if you are not rooted in Christ, you are literally going to wither away and die. And when Peter says, look, what we see here is that Peter's faith is rising up in his heart. And he's not just seeing with his eyes, but he's seeing with the eyes of his heart. Did you know that we can see with the eyes of our heart? In fact, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, that's what it says. It says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? And so Peter says, look, it's withered away from the roots. And Jesus says, I know because anything I say, it happens. And Jesus says, that temple over there that you see, it's about to wither away too. Because I'm going to form a new temple, and I'm going to form that new temple in your heart. For I will be cursed on a tree so that I may cleanse your temple, so that your heart will be changed, so that I may dwell inside you. Friends, that's what Jesus did for us on the cross so many years ago. So that we would know the riches of His glory, so that we would have faith in God, and He's inviting you today to put your faith in His Son, in Jesus. He came to abolish religion for relationship. He came and laid or was put on that cross to absorb the wrath of God that we all deserved. And He took that on the cross and He washed us in His blood so that by His blood we are washed white as snow from our sins so that our heart would be made new. He wants, listen to me, look at me, He wants a relationship with you. If you're watching online today, Jesus wants a relationship with you. That's why He freely laid His life down. That's why He was was tortured and He suffered and was nailed to a cross so that He could restore that relationship that was forever changed in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis. He sent his son to die on a cross to be crushed so he could repair what sin 
had taken away. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life, and whoever believes in me shall have eternal life. Maybe you've never tasted and seen that God is good. Maybe God has used his word this morning, if you're watching online or in purpose, to help you realize that you are in desperate need of a Savior, that you are a sinner, and that you are spiritually dead. And he's saying, come to me, for I'm the bread of life. I'm the living water. You will drink of my water, and it will quench your thirst. Maybe you realize that you being a sinner, that you deserve the wrath of God and that you need a Savior. Or maybe you are a believer and you realize, I don't know how much fruit is evident in my life. Maybe you need to confess to God today, God, I don't know how much fruit is on my tree. God, I don't want to be just a tree of leaves. So as Trey begins to lead us here in just a moment in response to God's word, I would just ask for you to search your heart. If you're a believer, I would just ask God to examine my heart. God, if, if I'm not exhibiting, if I'm not producing any fruit, would you help me, Holy Spirit? Would you give me the truth? Would you lead me in wisdom? God, I need you. I need your grace and mercy today. Maybe you've never surrendered your heart to God. Maybe it's time for you to make that profession of faith. Maybe the Holy Spirit is leading you right now in this moment to do that. And I just want to encourage you just to cry out to the Lord. He can hear you. So Trey, would you lead us? Would you lead us in that song?
Listen, I don't, I don't care what darkness you may be in right now. I don't care how deep in sin you may feel you've gone. But you can never outrun the grace of the cross. Well, God is speaking to hearts today. He's healing the brokenness inside you. If you just let him. If you just call out. If you ask him to break down the walls of your heart, he'll do it. He's faithful, I promise. There's nowhere that God is not. There's nowhere he cannot reach you. The word says, where can I go? Even, even Jonah said, where can I go? Even the de- in the depths of Sheol, you are there, God. So I just encourage you, if God is speaking to your heart this morning to surrender, to cry out to Him, to pray to Him, to admit, God, I'm a sinner. I need you, Lord. I need your grace and mercy. I believe, Jesus, that you're the Son of God, that you came to this earth to die so that I might have relationship with you and the Father and the Holy Spirit again. That you paid the penalty for my sins that I should have paid. And your blood has washed me white as snow. Listen, as we transition to the end of our service, there's one more thing that we do as part of our worship service. That is part of worship. It's called giving. It's called the offering. It's part of what we believe as Christians. And we are to give 10% of what God has given us back to Him. Listen, I want to, this is mainly for our celebration faith family, but if God puts it on your heart to give, I would encourage you to obey God. And there's different ways that we do that here. We don't pass around a plate. We have two black boxes at the back where you can drop your offering in to God. You can text it in. You can mail a check in if you want to. You can do it online if you're watching online. And here's what I want to encourage you in, that whatever you give, that we use that in ministry to minister to people in this faith family, that we use it to minister to people in Uganda, in Papua New Guinea, across this world, across this nation. And you've been so faithful, Celebration family, to give. I would encourage you. The Lord says it is more blessed to give than to receive. If you don't give, you are missing out on a blessing. And I don't mean, hear me now, I don't mean that when you give, you're going to get that Mercedes that you've been hoping for. That's not what giving's about. We don't give to get. We get to give. But I also want to encourage you that this is, a, this is an important part of worship. It's important for every ministry, for every faith family. And please don't take it lightly. If you have any questions about tithing or giving or why as Christians, you can call me, you can email me, you can text me, you can catch me after service. This is part of the convictions as Christians why we do what we do. There's reasons why. And so I would encourage you, if you don't know those reasons, to seek out the why. It's not about how much you give. It's about the intentions of your heart. It's about being a joyful giver. So I'm going to pray for our offering and then we're going to dismiss. Have you been blessed this morning? Amen. Can you feel God's presence in this place today? Father, we just thank you. God, we thank you because you give us way more. Way more than we deserve. God, and this is just a time where we give back such a small portion of all that you've entrusted us with. And we do it with a cheerful heart. We do it in faith. And God, I pray that you would take 
this offering that we cheerfully give, that you would bless it, that you would grow it. And God, I pray that you would use it in such a way that you would get all the honor and all the credit for it. So Father, I, could, I just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us and give us wisdom as a faith family of Celebration Church. God, I pray that we would not be hypocrites when we leave this place. God, I pray that if there's any hypocritical ways in our life right now, God, that you would point those out to us. And here's the great thing, Lord, you do it in, in such a way that's with mercy and with grace and with love. And God, would you help to, to change us, to mold us to be more like your son, Jesus. And God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but we would also be doers of your word. That we would look more like Christ tomorrow than we did today. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would fill us with the fruits of the Spirit. May we walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Don't forget, if you are a guest with us today, we have a gift for you right outside here. And if you filled out one of those connection cards to so drop those in the black boxes on your way out. And actually today starts one last thing don't open that door one last thing today starts 21 days of prayer and so all throughout the week over the next three weeks the church will be open bj correct me if i'm wrong from 7 from 6 30 to 7 30 and so the, what that looks like is you just come up here you could be here for one minute or you could be here for an hour it's not about the time right? If you pray for an hour, that doesn't make you more spiritual. Jesus doesn't give you extra cheese dip when you go for lunch. That's not how it works. But listen, we do this every year, twice a year as a faith family to come together and to pray for our faith family, to pray for our nation, to pray for the world and for what God is doing in us and through us. And so I invite you 630 to 730 Monday through Friday, correct? Okay. Please, we'll have music pray, uh, playing. You can worship. You can pray. You can pray out loud. You can pray quietly. Whatever you, however you want to worship, it's fine. But please, I encourage you to come. It's very powerful. It'll transform your life. Amen? Don't forget about our women's conference next Friday and Saturday. Be blessed, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.